Hello there, and welcome to another Classic Golf Club. There have been many advances in golf club design over the years. Some are significant and have a lasting impact on future designs. Others turn out to be blind alleys or even just short-lived fashions. Among significant advances that have stuck would be such as perimeter weighting and bigger club heads, lighter shafts. Short-lived fashions might include white drivers and aluminium shafts. Some changes fall between the two. They have a positive design impact, but are also a bit of a passing fad. One of these could be low profile irons, and that's the subject of today's video. What did they do for the golfer, and why did they disappear so quickly? The first such club to make an impact was the Browning 440, which is covered in today's video. It created a stampede by other manufacturers bringing out their own versions, afraid that they might miss out on the revolution. I'll be playing a few holes with a set of Browning 440s later on, but before that, and before we go into a bit more detail about the low profile iron boom, let's have a quick look at the 440s. As a special treat today, we have not just the clubs, but Browning, a Browning bag. A very nice green browning bag. So let's have a look what clubs we have in there. When we talk about the browning 440 it's usually the irons that uh, grab most of the headlines for their very individual look but the woods or some of the woods uh, are also very individualistic as well. I've seen a couple of different types of uh, woods for the browning 440 but these ones uh, I think are very unusual. Um, so let's, we've got a, a one, three, four, five here. So if we start off with the, uh, the five wood, uh, straight away you can see that it's, it's an unusual shape just from looking at the bottom of it. So we've got number five browning there and on the toe the 440 uh, decal. It's a laminated head, plain insert, no screws. And if we look at it uh, from the user's point of view we can see this very unusual shape it always reminds me of a, a sort of a cloven hoof and it's not just the five wood that's like this uh, all the others are too um, looking at the uh, elements in a bit more detail you can see that it's my favorite color scheme black red insert wooden face nice uh, whipping there ferrule a couple of gold bands the shaft is a uh, doesn't actually say on this one but these are true temper shafts uh, it's got a browning mark there made in usa uh, doesn't give a, a flex on but the irons i've got they do say regular flex grip these are getting on a little bit but they're still playable uh, golf pride made in usa so that's the uh, the five wood as I say, I've also got the one wood, same appearance. This one's got a bit of damage on the paint finish on the toe, a um, bit of a uh, range mat use on there as well. And that's uh, one, three, four, five, the Browning 440 uh, laminated woods. So now let's move on to the, the irons. And here they are, the iconic Browning 440 uh, irons. We have here three, four, five, seven, eight pitching wedge and sand iron. I have the full set, but um, these are the ones I can fit comfortably on the table. And straight away, you'll notice with the lower profile, I can fit more irons here than I normally do. So let's uh, let's have a look at one of these and see what all the fuss is about. They are a very uh, striking club. Uh, if we look at the the shape there, it's very elegant. Browning 440, a deep sort of cavity there very heavy sole um, I'll talk about the uh, the design philosophy behind these um, a little bit later in the video um, but these were the first sort of really successful low profile irons and they, they sort of uh, spawned a whole lot of copycat clubs um, in the two or three years that followed before the whole low profile 
um, concept seem to uh, fade away uh, into the background and we, we don't see really any uh, any clubs comparable with these these days so let's have a look at the the features we've already discussed the the nice uh, sort of cavity back there the the heavy sole it's got a short um, hosel uh, no ferrule just a shaped thing there we look at the the face itself we can really see uh, the low profile there. Not got many uh, lines at all on there. It's quite a long head. Uh, I'll bring in a comparative four iron from the sort of the same uh, period as these. I think these date from about 1978. And this is a, a similar uh, vintage four iron, a standard four iron. It's actually a Ben Sayers silver crest. There we go, Ben Sayers, Silvercrest, and they're both four irons. So we can see straight away uh, the much deeper face on the uh, the Ben Sayers club, much longer hosel. The whole idea here, they were trying to get as much weight um, low down on the club as possible, moving it away from the ferrule, and also onto the toe end of the club. If we look at the uh, top views, we can see that the... The browning uh, it's got a lot of weight in that toe portion there whereas the silver crest it's got some additional weight there in this band but most of the uh, the weight or, or there hasn't been any attempt to move away from the traditional blade shape on that one so that's the the four iron and if we look from uh, Let's take a look at the pitching wedge because this is the one that always sort of unnerves me the most when I'm playing these. If we look at the three iron and the pitching wedge, uh, I mean the three iron is really low profile. But when you're standing above uh, above the ball, just bang the camera there with the pitching wedge, you, you see very little uh, of the face. Whereas if we look at the, the sand iron, put that down next to it. You can see that it's a, a much bigger uh, face there. You can really get an idea of the, the size there. The profile of the pitching wedge, I think the height wise, it's probably the same as the three iron. Let's just pull that one back. Clatter, clatter, clatter. I'll just put my finger across there. You can see that they, they are very similar um, in height. We've got that same deep, um, well, not so deep on the pitching wedge. You've got even more weight down at the bottom there. Let's put the, the three iron back over there. And that one back there. Is that the three iron? Yeah, that's the three iron. So let's return ourselves back to the four iron. Let's finish off a quick look at the shaft. We can see a shaft transfer there. If I can get that in focus. True temper, finest quality, and the shaft band, Browning 440, and this one does say regular flex on it. Same grips as the uh, the woods we saw, Golf Pride Pro only. Uh, so yeah, it's a, a very uh, striking set of irons. I don't play them very often. Um, they do have quite a bit of offset on the head, which is not something I'm wildly keen on. Um, let me bring that round, see if I can get that visible there. There we are, so we can see there, there's quite a bit of offset on the head. Uh, so they, they do take a bit of getting used to, but I, I, I sort of try and play them at least once a year, um, just for that sort of uh, novelty element really, I suppose. And off fairways, they are very nice to play. Uh, not so nice out of deep rough. Um, it's quite easy to um, go underneath the ball or hit it very high on the face. Uh, so yeah, that's the uh, Browning 440 irons. Putter for the round with the, the Brownings will be uh, this one, which I hope you can instantly tell is quite a bit older. Um, this is a, a sort of a golden goose style, quite a high um, toe portion compared to the, uh, the what I call the tail portion, and it's not a, a John Letters golden goose. We can see the name there: Piri of Glasgow, Gold Strike. 
And we've also got Eric Brown's name on the end there as well. Quite a, a nice little ferrule on there. It's a narrow diameter shaft and the ferrule um, a red and orange uh, band on there. The shaft itself is a true temper. That's the only bit of the, the transfer or the, the band that's left. Original leather grip, I think. No writing on the end there. Bit of a pistol grip, I suppose. Golden Goose style putter. You can see it is pinned on the head. Uh, I'm not sure whether John Letters did that with their uh, early Golden Goose uh, putters or not. Uh, that's something that Peary of Glasgow obviously did do. Let's get back to the 440s then. I should say that there were previous low profile club designs. There's nothing new in golf after all. However, the Browning 440s can lay claim to being the first commercially successful design. And as we'll see, they drew many imitators. Much of the information I've found came from the April 1979 edition of Golf World magazine. This focused on the low profile iron craze, but it had obviously taken off some time before this for it to already gain such traction. But who or what was behind them? For this we need to travel back to the early 1970s and to Belgium. More specifically, the laboratories of Fabrique Nationale, which was an independently owned manufacturer of armaments, jet engines and sporting arms, located in Herstel, Belgium. Around this time, the company was looking to diversify and use its personnel and machinery in different areas. Golf and ballistics, it was decided, had a lot in common. Philippe Jaegers, I apologise for the pronunciation, which I'm sure will be wrong, was given a simple brief. Design the most scientifically efficient instrument for striking a golf ball and make it different. Philippe was not a golfer and believes that had he been, then his design would not have gone down the path it did, as he would have been constrained by existing preconceptions about club design. Using their in-house tools, Philip studied the characteristics of successful clubs and took high-speed photographs of ball impacts using their high-speed cameras. From this data, he developed the first prototype in 1974. The objective was to lower the centre of gravity and improve the aerodynamics, hence the low profile with extreme sole weighting. As well as the low profile, the clubs also had a large offset. The Browning Company, with which Fabrique Nationale had had a long relationship, were chosen to deliver the clubs to market, and in 1976 the first Browning 440 clubs were available. The following year, Jürgens designed a non-offset model, the 500. But although I prefer the lack of offset, I think it doesn't have the stark beauty of the original 440 design. Initial sales of the Browning 440 were strong and not wanting to be left behind, competitors quickly brought out their own low-profile designs. From the big American names, we have McGregor with their MG Lite, Wilson with their LP, PGA with their LCG model, and Titleist with their Super Slim model. And in the UK, the major brands also jumped on the bandwagon. The Slim Line from Ben Sayers, the Dunlop Power Float and Dunlop Maxfly low profile, the John Letters LP100, the Styx low profile model, the Rider Low Pro, the prize winner from Edinburgh Golf and the Slazinger Peter Alice LP model. You'd have thought with so much investment by so many manufacturers that low profile clubs would be around for a long time. The clubs did launch the ball well with their low centre of gravity and so even the longer irons were quite easy to play. It was a little harder to prove that the low profile aerodynamic aspect had any meaningful impact on the average golfer's club head speed but even so, sales were initially good. However, there was a big but. That but was that while the clubs played very well from a nicely cut fairway, trying to play from anything but the lightest of rough became an issue. 
It was very difficult to strike the ball from the sweet spot near the bottom of the club when the head was so shallow. In fact, it was even possible to go under the ball completely when it was sat in fluffy rough. Whether this was the only reason or not for their fall from grace, I don't know. But looking at the prices shown in the equipment listings, it's also apparent that most manufacturers had them at the premium end. Whatever the reason, within just a couple of years, low profile clubs were in the cut price bins of most retailers and manufacturers had dropped them like a red hot coal. In fact, some manufacturers went even further than that and started going the opposite way with high faced clubs, such as the Byron High Blade shown here. OK, time to put the 440s to the test. Before we do, as usual, here are the lofts for the clubs. And we can see that the iron lofts are fairly typical for the time. Before we begin playing, I thought it would be interesting to take a player's eye look at the clubs. I think you'll agree it's an unusual shape to come around the other side for a slightly different light. So that's the three iron. You can see a bit of offset, quite a long head, pitching wedge. Well, you just don't see that much blade really, and quite a bit of offset. Onto the course then, and starting on the first hole. The weather was a bit overcast and Shot Tracer was struggling to pick up the ball, so not many shots are uh, uh, shown on Shot Tracer. But the tee shot was a decent strike, 200 yards down the middle. And that left me 150 to go, and I hit a 7 iron. Again, a, a decent strike, got me onto the green, and I had this uh, put for my outside chance of a birdie, which I left just that little bit short, just enough to a, a bit of a knee knocker, but it rolled in nicely for a, for a par. Onto the short second hole, seven nine again, and I caught this one very nicely middle of the green and quite close to the flag. Another chance for a par, two pars on the trot that would be. But even better. London buses these birdies. For anybody that doesn't understand the reference to London buses, there's a saying that you can wait for ages for a, a bus and then two will come along at once. And I've just had two birdies on the channel after waiting for ages. Next hole then, par five, one wood. Decent enough strike, just into the right rough. And here I'm taking the five iron. And caught that pretty well, it went 181 yards left me 127 yards so I'm now starting to get excited thinking three greens in reg on the trot and so I hit this uh, fairly thin pull shot into the bunker right pretty uh, typical winter bunker I have to take a drop and so get a, a very unattractive lie just doing my best to get this out Not the best, but I was pleased it was out and it ran onto the back fringe. So rather than chip, I took the putter. Where I was aiming, I don't know. It was so far left, it was unreal. But it left me a fairly straightforward put for a, a bogey, which I straightforwardly missed. So that was a double bogey. Into the last hole I was playing driver again and a decent shot onto the fairway. This left me a long way out. I hit three iron just to see how that played and as you can see it launched the ball very well and it went 189 yards. Well, the three iron went 188 which I'm pleased with. I can sell this one though so see how I can chip with a low profile eight iron. A chip for me with any club is a testing situation. too bad. I was pleased with that. So another put for a par. Not quite though but as easy a, a tap in for a bogey as you're likely to see. 
So to summarise then, add one par, one birdie, a double bogey and a bogey for a two over par total. So very pleased with that. The clubs performed very well. The woods, despite their unusual shape, were very effective and the long irons certainly launched the ball easily. I didn't get to play any shots out of deep rough, so I can't comment on that side of the play. But overall, very positive results. Well, thanks for watching and I hope to see you next time.